All right, well, welcome everyone remotely from the US Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Shannon Connors, and I would like to welcome you to the fourth webinar in the Forest for the Birds Conserving America's Forest Birds series. We will be introducing our speaker, Bob Ford, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service in just a moment. But first, I'd like to remind you of a few logistical details. The Forest for the Birds Conserving America's Forest Birds webinar series is jointly sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation <laughs> Training Center, Forest Ecology Working Group, and the Migratory Bird Program. And we'll share this contact information in the chat box if you're interested in learning more about the Forest Ecology Working Group, or if you'd like to receive continuing education credits for attending these webinars. And just a quick disclaimer, this product is for educational purposes only. The views, opinions, or positions expressed in this webinar series are those of the guest presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or positions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of the Interior. Some of the materials and images may be protected by copyright or may have been licensed to us by a third party and are restricted in their use. Mention of any product names, companies, web links, textbooks, or other references does not imply federal endorsement. And to introduce Bob Ford and give us a little bit more information on this webinar series, we have Jeff Horan from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Jeff, welcome, and thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Shannon. And as Shannon me mentioned, my name is Jeff Horan. I'm a forest ecologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Refuge Program in the North Atlantic yeah. Appalachian Region. And I'm with the Forest Ecology Working Group, which worked with partners to create this 12-part webinar series. I'll be monitoring moderating today's webinar and monitoring the chat for your questions. Um, and so I also wanted to thank NCTC, you know, Shannon, Jim Siegel, and our Forest Bird team for all the great assistance for, the, for this. The 12-part Forest for the Birds webinar series is jointly sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Forest Ecology Working Group, the National Conservation Training Center, and the Migratory Birds Program. The purpose of the Forest Ecology Working Group in this webinar series is to increase the understanding and integration of forest ecology, applied science, and habitat management principles within the Fish and Wildlife Service and also with our partners. The Migratory Bird Program is pleased to be co-sponsoring this webinar series as part of the Partners in Flight Program's 30-year celebration and also the recognition of the documented loss of some 3 billion birds over the last 50 years. There is still much conservation work to do, and this is part of the roadmap to recovery of forest birds. If you have questions about this webinar series or our forest ecology working group, my contact information is on the flyer, and I'd be glad to talk to you more. For folks needing Wildlife Society or Society of American Foresters continuing education credits, you can contact Jim Siegel, whose contact information is also on the flyer. I also wanted to mention quickly that today we're going to try something new. For webinar participants who are interested in staying for just a few minutes after Bob's presentation today, so again around 2 o'clock, we have a seven-minute PowerPoint video narrated also by Bob Ford on desired forest conditions in the bottomland hardwood forest of Mississippi Alluvial Valley. This video is part of our efforts to provide you a little more useful information on managing forest to benefit birds. The video was produced by Bob Ford, Randy Wilson, the Forest Ecology Working Group, NCTC, Mike Birds, and the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture Partnership. Now, a little now to get started with Blueprint for Success: How and Where to Focus Bird Conservation. So, before so to introduce. Before I introduce Bob, I did want to get, run a quick commercial, <laughs> one more commercial, and that is for our webinar five July tw on July 20th, and that's the theme is conservation design and landscape to stand, which is where we are today, but the title of the presentation will be the Habitat Matrix, Stepping Down Bird Management from Landscape to Stand, and it's Jeffrey Larkin is our speaker from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and the American Bird Conservancy. Now, finally, to introduce Bob Ford. Bob has worked in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 20 years in both the Migratory Bird Program and in science, the Science Applications Program. Work on bird conservation and forest management has been Bob's central career component, primarily in southeastern forests, but, but other forest types around the country as well. For the Fish and Wildlife Service, Bob has served in many roles within the Migratory Bird Program. He is currently the U.S. Coordinator for the Partners in Flight Initiative. 
Now for webinar four, Blueprint for Success, How and Where to Focus Bird Conservation. Bob, please take it from here. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks, Shannon, for getting us kicked off here. It's my honor to be here, actually. It's uh, quite fun, and I'm looking forward to it. Let me get this set up. Jeff, can you see everything on my screen okay? I, I can, Bob, and it's covering, it looks like it's covering the whole screen, so you look good. Okay. Uh, blueprint for success. Well, in today for today's conversation, what is blueprint? The blueprint is the context of the landscape. What you see on the left there is actually the entire lower Mississippi Valley from Cairo, Illinois, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And the landscape has a mix of uh, forest, primarily isolated across it, and context from the large landscape to the local landscape to stand conditions uh, influences the content of that stand and also influences how we think about bird conservation and bird management. What kinds of civil cultural techniques are appropriate given the isolation or the connectivity of those forest stands? I'm going to spend most of my talk uh, going through three examples at a fairly high level of how different partnerships have done that in landscape. But I want to take just a minute to make sure we we're all on the same page here about where this idea comes from, conservation biology, and that track size does make a difference regardless of stand condition. It started in the 1960s with uh, MacArthur and Wilson's publication, Island Biogeography, the idea that uh, larger islands have higher species diversity than smaller islands. That got transferred to uh, terrestrial systems, habitat islands, uh, separated by major obstacles, excuse me, major obstacles like, um, oh, it could be urban areas, uh, uh, row crop agriculture or whatever, but that at some point, uh, the size and shape affects species. At what size and shape the species begin to blink out and why, regardless of the stand condition. For example, where that wood thrush is, is in a forest interior of a large square block. However, it may not be able to persist in smaller blocks of different configuration. So through the 80s, there was a lot of conversation and debate about uh, track size and corridors, drove a lot of good conservation research. Reed Noss, Daniel Simberloff, and others were key to the discussion. Uh, Sloss was a raging debate for a while. It still is in some degrees, but there's uses for either single large or several small tracks as the priority for conservation action at a landscape scale. And by the 1980s, about the same time, uh, late 1980s, Chan Robbins was looking at the Breeding Birds Survey and saw a notable decline in long distance migrants, a disproportionate decline to resident species or some short distance migrants, and began to apply the area size requirements to breeding birds and came up with this publication that documented the probability of occurrence of birds in various track sizes in the Atlantic states, mid-Atlantic states. That was, um, and then habitat fragmentation in the temperate zone was part of a, uh, um, a uh, big conference, science conference, conference and it was published in 1992 and all of this was about the time that partners in flight came to fruition so partners in flight was very much in the middle of the debate in the middle of the conversation and in the middle of applied conservation using landscape scale uh, concepts and principles just what is it that makes uh, track size that makes birds sensitive to forest track size We've probably all been uh, in classes where we know the uh, quote hostile conditions around edge and edge effect. There's an increase in nest predation and parasitism. There's an increase in invasive species. There's a higher probability that storms and winds will impact stand conditions. And all of those, is a smaller and smaller tract of forest gets those effects more and more pronounced throughout the tract until it can change the entire serial stage and, and change the entire composition at some point. However, larger track sizes are important for these birds 
for other reasons as well. This basic uh, forest dynamics, the tract has to be large enough to create microhabitats in which these birds can go through the entire nesting season, if not the full annual cycle for some resident species. But in the top left is cerulean warbler. For example, it requires a diverse canopy structure, uh, including tree fall gaps, canopy gaps, gaps created by um, group selection cuts, for example, in a small track small forest tract, this isn't large enough to hold both closed canopy and these canopy gaps distributed in such a way for cerulean is one thought. Wood thrush, uh, it likes to nest in the mid, mid to understory, mid story of open forests. However, once the nestlings fledge, uh, there are repeated studies that show the wood, wood thrush take their fledglings to thick, thick shrubby areas within the forest. So small clear cuts, again, group selection cuts next to open woodlands is important for that species and a small tract can rarely handle both those kinds of conditions. Golden wing warbler is at the other end of the spectrum. It's a early seral stage bird, likes uh, new forest and it nests there. But when new forest, uh, but when their nestlings fledge, they take their young to pole size conditions. And so they need a larger track in order to um, in order to have those different kind of micro habitats available to the nesting cycle. And for whatever reason, edge effect or micro habitats or some reasons unknown, uh, more and more research began to define track size requirements for a variety of species. You see here Hamill's Guide to Birds of the South, published in 1992, where he put out these track sizes for sustainable populations of birds ranging from uh, just these four examples ranging from uh, nearly a thousand to over four thousand acres in track size work particularly on thrushes in the east all thrushes uh, probability of occurrence for wood thrush and fall patches less than 200 acres is is very small and more of those studies have been uh, published and more out uh, all the time um, now to go to these to some examples about how we've used track size and landscape scale uh, uh, look at the world to help influence stand management the context of the landscape compared to the content of the forest track for the bird world uh, a lot of that spatial analysis has been done by migratory bird joint venture partnerships, and they'll be the root of a couple of examples that I'll use today. So I'll go through three. Uh, uh, well, let me take first. I don't know that anyone has mentioned too much about joint venture partnerships in these conversations. You see here the map of the geography of uh, joint ventures. They are self-directed partnerships at large landscape scales but then apply projects at a more local scale. Uh, they have staff and partnerships that often uh, deal with cutting edge science, then conservation design or the uh, configuration of the landscape, conservation delivery, habitat or policy projects, and then communications and outreach and other aspects to some joint ventures. Today, I'll talk a little bit about the lower Mississippi Valley joint venture. Uh, and then we'll take a short break for questions. And I'll move in the second part of the discussion to the Appalachian Mountains and then a trip to the Pacific Northwest to finish things up. Shannon, and I got frozen there just for a second. I hope that's the last time. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Lower Mississippi Valley Partnership, you see it there circled in or a square red around it. It um, goes from Cairo, Illinois to Gulf of Mexico, the same area that I showed in the beginning slide. Major ecosystem changes in uh, the time since Europeans arrived. Over a 75% reduction in forested area, <clears throat> leaving a landscape that has isolated forest tracks, uh, over 35,000 forest blocks now occur <clears throat> of a wide variety of sizes and, and sometimes corridors, most often not. They're isolated, fragmented forests. Most of that loss has occurred on the high site forests, that is the sites that don't flood. Jeff mentioned the uh, 
uh, the uh, recorded PowerPoint to come up right after our webinar today. I'll do just a little bit more detail about what that means in terms of forest management in the lower Mississippi Valley. What's a high site compared to a wet site? But important for now is the forest breeding bird decision support model that was developed by the lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture Partnership. And I thank Michael Mitchell and Minnie and Keith McKnight for sharing some of these slides and helping with this part of the presentation. The original model was in, in 2001. And the model was almost purely a reforestation priority model using 1999 satellite imagery and 1999 Partners in Flight Regional Bird Conservation Plan. We picked uh, various species, three different ecological suites that included several species within each suite and went to the literature and other aspects of conservation biology and determined a forest area that would be required to sustain populations of each of these species. At the smaller end of the spectrum for forest core, forest interior birds, this suite of species with the focal species being Swainson's warbler occurs and we wanted to have a distributed, um, distributed and if possible connected network of forest areas that were greater than or equal to 5,000 acres for this suite of species. We bumped it up a notch for cerulean warbler, a forest and a suite of species that require 10,000 acres or more in the forest interior. And then for swallowtail white and other species in the lower Mississippi Valley, um, forest patches that are 100,000 acres or more in the landscape in order to sustain populations of, of these species. And obviously, um, from the 100,000 acre forested track could capture both the 10,000 acre birds and the 5,000 acre birds. The attempt was to make this uh, less opportunistic and more strategic. Where are the existing tracks where we could add to a 3,000 acre make track and make it a, a 6,000 acre track for Swainson's Warbler? Where is the tracks where it's 9,000 acres and more or less a square? that we can make it a over 10,000 acres track for the Cerulean Warbler Suite. And where is, uh, where are, and interestingly, uh, you know, there's to look for areas where are two 4,000 acre tracks that we could uh, reforest in the middle and make a 10,000 acre track. So there are lots of decisions along the way. Uh, we wanted to maximize each acre uh, of reforestation to contribute to more desirable forested conditions. So it started with pixels that are not forest, but could be. In other words, uh, we eliminated urban developed reservoirs, for example. Uh, a deciding factor was proximity to an existing forest core. The decrease, decreased value on pixels on the lower weather elevations, because that's the primary forest type there, which would be more towards the end of Cypress Tupelo. And we excluded historic prairie, which naturally wanted to go towards grassland with the proper disturbance. And importantly, I'll talk about this in a slide or two uh, coming up, the percent forest cover in the quote, local landscape. We wanted to find areas where there's 70 to 100% of forest in blocks of actually 80,000 acres. I apologize for that typo. It's, uh, or my misunderstanding actually. The blocks in the local landscape are actually 80,000 acres, not 10. There was significant, uh, <laughs> there is significant progress, has been significant progress that is ongoing for reforestation efforts in the lower Mississippi Valley, thanks in large part to the Joint Venture Partnership. As I said, the original model was solely a reforestation model. And in the 2000s, by 2007, the partnership published this. It's gotten to be known as the desired forest condition for wildlife. It uh, goes from the context of the forested landscape to the content of the forest stand and how should those look over time and in those local landscapes? Once again, my mistake, that should be greater than 80,000 acre landscapes out there in the lower Mississippi Valley. 
Across those local landscapes, the forest cover ideally would be 70 to 100 percent. Some of the forests be actively managed, some passively managed. Managed forest up to 70 or 95 percent. And of that managed forest, 10 percent or less in regeneration and less than 5 percent in shrub scrub. So at any one point in time in an actively managed forest, it's uh, it's probably pole timber or or a little bit larger to saw timber kinds of forest conditions. Within those forest conditions, what we are shooting for for bird conservation and other wildlife is a structurally diverse and species composition diverse forest. To get a structurally diverse forest, diverse in age and diameter disturbance is required, either natural or human. Today we're primarily thinking about human uh, disturbance in terms of civil culture and active forest management for improvement of stand conditions. And these are the metrics that we've put out in the Desired Forest Conditions Handbook. The primary metrics are canopy cover, basal area, mid-story cover, and understory cover. You see there the desired stand conditions. The secondary matrix uh, go from dominant trees to small cavity and den trees to regeneration in certain areas, 30 to 40 percent of the area. For stand composition, uh, 30 to 40 percent is recommended to be moving towards oak forest. There it is. Um, it's important to remember that these metrics only reflect stand average, not every acre uh, needs to reflect the forest conditions here. So if uh, we can get on average the metrics that we just talked about, that's it, um, not every acre. We realize that uh, no two stands are the same. There are past logging conditions that dictate the logging conditions that should be happening now. Landowners have different objectives from a hunting club to a hobby forest to a uh, economic forest to whatever. So we recognize those. And as a result, there is no single civil cultural prescription that is either right or wrong. That's up to the, uh, the local forester and wildlife biologist and the landowner and manager to decide for sure. However, the end goal are indeed those metrics that we've discussed. Jeff, I think I'll I'll take a short break there and see if there's any questions from uh, our audience and remind you that that last part there in lower Mississippi Valley is is what the recorded PowerPoint will be uh, after the hour here after we finish up the webinar. So, so, Bob, there's a good question in here, and I think it it deals with you know some what I think some people see as contradiction. So discussing the loss of forest in the Mississippi alluvial valley, the question from Sharon was, does forest management fragment forested habitat and cause negative impacts to interior dwelling forest birds? That is, that's an excellent question. One that has come up often. My answer is that it really depends on the context of that too depends on the context of the landscape obviously a uh, let's say a major clear cut of uh 60 acres and 100 acre stand is uh what i consider fragmentation but you know 60 acres in a much larger stand or a forested landscape probably not however for the general answer to your question is no and um I'll show I'll show a couple examples here after the break, and maybe we can revisit that question. Um, the general answer is no. As long as, in my mind, the land use stays in forestry, then the fragmentation issues are temporary, whichever may occur. Obviously, uh, nest predation by brown-headed cowbirds can cowbirds can come in on roads, uh, predators. Um, come in on roads and go from roads into areas and do better in in areas that have been recently cut. But you know, I guess for, for my answer, it's it's generally no in the long term view of things. As long as it stays in forest land use. 
All right. So, so I know we don't have a lot of time, Bob, but this, this question I think might be helpful to folks moving forward. So it was, there were, were a couple questions about the desired forest conditions. And so the questions were, what scale are you setting the desired forest condition? What scale do you usually set desired forest conditions? Across the, um, I'll get confirmation of this from the lower Mississippi Valley joint venture. I was, uh, I was involved in the, in the first modeling uh, in 2000 that I mentioned, uh, and not so much in these next two examples, but I think that finding those 80,000 acre blocks with 70 to 100% forest is the first step. Those local landscapes are then defined and the desired forest condition across those local landscapes is what my answer would be. And so you think about that local landscape, right? There's their passive management may not be intentional by in some tracks. It may be a absentee landowner that hasn't thought about that tract in years. So passive management over 10 or more percent of the area could be expected in that large of a landscape where active management uh, can also happen there as well in, in a wide variety of ways. Okay, thanks, Bob. So I'm going to disappear here and let you uh, get back to it. Okay. All right. Um, well, we go from there to uh, a different example, a heavily forested landscape in the eastern United States, the Appalachian Mountain Joint Venture Geography. You can see here it stretches from New York well into North Georgia and Alabama um, as compared to the lower Mississippi Valley, which is, which is highly fragmented forest. So the approach with Appalachian Mountain Joint Venture folks is, is very different. And I want to thank them, especially Todd Fear and others who uh, shared the information and shared some of these slides as well. Across that large landscape, uh, somewhat of a similar approach in that they let birds and opportunities, strategic opportunity drive where focal landscapes occur, where are they going to work from New York into uh, Georgia and Alabama. These focal landscapes can be really huge, millions of acres. Uh, this example, for as an example, is over 2 million acres. And within those focal landscapes, they identify areas of prioritized forest, which are 100,000 acres or more, and then step that down another step to dynamic forest restoration blocks of 5,000 acres to 25,000 acres each. This which then these dynamic forest restoration blocks where the most concentrated effort with landowners and land managers occur. It's in these spots where um, populations of birds are specifically identified and, and uh, forest management prescriptions are developed in order to enhance those populations or to sustain those populations. So those three or four slides in a summary slide uh, out of this huge landscape, the course selection and conservation planning is at the scale of one or more million acres, the focal landscape. Then they step that down into areas with the highest potential of management or protection to benefit priority species and habitats. Once again, very large acreage of 100,000 acres or more. Within those areas, within the um, uh, these next steps there, the 100,000 acre or more, are the dynamic restoration blocks. They're selected areas for comprehensive planning, and uh, there are usually more than one, there's always more than one block of five or 25,000 acres per focal landscape. The attributes of the local landscape to help make those decisions for the partnership of where to work Let's look at uh, some of the bird examples here and some of the same ones that we've discussed already. Cerulean warbler, for example, um, the landscape characteristic for what for which they look is over 70 percent forest cover within six miles of where the work is going to take place. And with that, there's surrounding large blocks of closed canopy forests. Again, large blocks, meaning uh, closed canopy that can include a diverse canopy structure for this particular species. And importantly, and not, not so much explicit in the lower miss uh, example, is that there 
their work um, is also dictated by the uh, occurrence of nearby other populations. So within five miles of known cerulean warbler populations is where they focus. Woodthrush, a little bit less track sensitive, but uh, forest blocks over 250 acres, 80% forest cover within one mile, 65% or more forest cover within three. And then for birds, a couple of, of, of game species as well. You see here rough grouse within five miles of existing grouse observations and an American woodcock, which is a wetland um, associated bird. So stream, wetland, or water body is an important characteristic of landscape for that species. It goes from uh, the planning stage to on the ground, st stand level guidance. How do we begin to move those uh, issues or those locations into a stand content that can sustain and increase populations of these target species? So from there, uh, large landscape planning use multiple conservation habitat specific plans to species specific response. There on the first two to your left are cerulean warbler and golden wing warbler. Um, those models are an expertise from wildlife biologists, field biologists for birds, combined with the local partner expertise, people who know the land, know the forest, know the land manager, expectations and objectives of that forest can then work together to adjust how needed and how appropriate common management practices and the silvicultural tools that benefit multiple priority species and multiple landowner objectives in the mississippi uh, in the appalachian mountains much like our next example too there's a a mix of private industrial private non-industrial and federal public land and state public land, which drives very different management objectives. The diversity across the landscape and forest type and seral stage can be a good thing, but it also needs to be planned to some degree. Um, for example, if at a landscape scale, somewhat oversimplified, but, but if a forest industry has uh, an Best forest management and objective for clear cut, they can provide habitat for golden wing warbler and, and several other species for nest for fledgling wood thrush, as I said earlier. But if there's US Forest Service right next door, uh, then they may want to go to the other end of the spectrum for their multi use outdoor recreation type objectives and move it towards older growth saw timber in order to diversify the forest across the landscape. Let's move out west where it's yet another uh, different example. Um, I want to thank here the Klamath Bird Observatory who who sometimes who works with the Pacific Birds Joint Venture, uh, a Klamath Bird Observatory. The director John Alexander and chief scientist Jamie Steve were very helpful in in uh, helping me understand these uh, issues and and working together with them for for several years now. Pacific Northwest. Um, the area again is very, very large geography. What you see here in the center, the blueberry colored circles are Washington state. Uh, they end at the uh, US border with Canada. And at the southern end, the bottom of that picture, you see orange colored circles. Uh, they are in Northern California. Each of those circles represents a permanent uh, bird monitoring station or a, or a bird, uh, or maybe not permanent bird research uh, opportunity that's ongoing. So you can see that the area first is rich in bird conservation studies, bird monitoring and bird research. Much of that is housed in the avian knowledge network which I won't talk about today, but it's, it might be worth you some time for you to uh, Google and, and look around in, and if you have bird data to contribute to or to use the data that is, that is uh, marked as public and usable for making decisions. 
Now this landscape, again, it's mostly forested, uh, it, but it's a patchwork of ownership. It's uh, Owenship, ownership, sorry for the misspelling. Um, mostly forested, it's a patchwork of ownership, but a little bit different than, than the Eastern United States. Here, this patchwork of ownership, uh, uh, just as a very general rule, uh, private industrial lands are uh, larger, um, private non-industrial lands can be larger, uh, federal public lands, especially federal, can be larger and placed uh, intermittently. And so the distribution of each of these hat of, of landowners uh, and the objectives which, which they manage forest creates uh, quilt work, a patchwork of forest conditions across the landscape. And it's within this patchwork that bird conservationists and wildlife biologists are trying to figure out how to go to uh, stand level recommendations. You see here on the map the uh, legend, the heavily disturbed area, the clear cut or burned um, diversity of broadleaf shrubs, but it does have several species of concern, indicator species supplying good habitat there. Emergent forest with silvicultural diversity, with structural diversity and broadleaf component also across the landscape under different management objectives and provide good habitat for these other species as well. To begin to get a handle on this landscape, uh, uh, Klamath Bird Observatory, that's their logo. The yellow bird is a yellow-breasted chat. Point Blue Bird Observatory and the U.S. Forest Service, other partners, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure including Oregon State University have and American Bird Conservancy and others have gone to climate smart planning by uh, uh, assigning birds to um, broad habitat suites. So conifer, grassland, oak woodland, and riparian. What you see here in this map represents climate smart. So the lighter brown is least probability of occurrence, the darker it gets the higher probability of occurrence of any one species or species richness within that particular habitat type. So there's some level of certainty that uh, species sweet will be present to abundant in those darker brown areas. And that, um, uh, that's helped to be driven by um, a species-centered habitat modeling I'll be upfront with you. I don't have much experience with this, but I read a couple of the papers and uh, species centered habitat modeling uh, as compared to Landsat imagery. It, it helps to take a species centered approach so that you see the landscape scale characteristics from what the bird and the local population of birds needs from that landscape. Uh, Landsite imagery is often us trying, us as humans trying to interpret human attributes of the landscape or, or how we assign human attributes of the landscape. Species-centered monitoring uh, does it slightly differently and has been uh, successful. It provides, as compared to land cover derived models, it has a higher prediction ability, wider temporal range, and it can avoid some uncertainty, the misclassification of habitats, emission of fine scale features, and and the subtle changes that we can see in uh, vegetation. Now, from this point of, of um, large landscape to species-centered habitat modeling to developing these more specific drive distribution models for individual species, then they too get to stand level management and where across a stand on average what would be good measures for uh, specific species as well as species richness. For example, perch purple finch habitat attributes in those areas of dark brown where they know that um, pine and oak occur and that species like pine, uh, purple finch uh, use those areas, maintain 60% of canopy, subcanopy closure, are ecologically appropriate on drier sites, and maintain at least 25% or more uh, habitat conservation strategies are there as well, all listed and available through published uh, habitat management plans as well as working with partners who know birds and know bird conservation and management needs and also know 
enough about forestry to be able to inform the forester of these uh, hab habitat attributes. I want to go back to that and walk through back to these climate smart planning examples and especially this time walk through oak woodland species. Um, I have worked with John and Jamie a bit and have gone to these oak woodland uh, communities and spent some time and they're, they're truly fascinating and present fa and present concepts of fragmentation in a way that admittedly haven't thought much about here in the East or in the United States. Um, for the oak habitats, the same process is used. I believe there's the Rogue River Valley, whereas distribution and maps can be laid out for several species, Lewis woodpecker, Lazlai bunting, spotted towhee for all species, for species richness to get a view of the landscape. The species habitat or species center models can uh, support those down to, uh, to uh, specific areas and patches of oak woodland in which to work and recognizing that uh, species richness in these habitats is of still a function of focal patch size and species richness decreased when the patch, when the oak woodland patch number decreased. And so what does that mean for uh, decreasing patch size and fragmentation in a landscape that's heavily forested? Oak woodland patch size is being diminished and species uh, are not as common and some species come in at, uh, well, are not as common in smaller patch sizes, and some species come in in larger patch sizes, especially when chaparral is al allowed to kind of mix in there with the oak woodland habitats. Uh, <clears throat> at the fragmentation here is not by non forest areas, it's, it's fragmentation uh, largely by uh, conversion to other forest types or by fire suppression, which leads to a succession to conifer. Uh, and as I understand it, Douglas fir. If I get any of this wrong, correct me in the chat. I'm, I'm not, know a little bit about Western forests and birds, but no expert by any means. So what are those threats? Uh, what are the real fragment, or what are fragmentation threats that in this heavily forested landscape may still be out there? The uh, uh, Klamath Siskiyou Basin, the Bow region, which is the area from which I've been talking, to. Klamath Siskiyou bioregion is known for its high biological diversity and heavily forested dynamic landscape. Um, and there's a strategic conservation plan out published in uh, published recently in 2020, I believe, by Alexander and others that um, discuss how this area should be managed from from landscape scale down to stand management. And of course, one section is included as threats. One of those threats is unplanned agriculture and uh, development and clearing small scattered patches within the forest. I've been, uh, something that uh, blindsided me, but had been going on for a little while was cannabis production in Northern California and potentially growing in Southern Oregon, which is legal. Um, some is not legal, some is legal, but it's, Clearing of small patches within a forested landscape to a different land use, obviously to a uh, ag, what's legally a ag production landscape. And I'm and, and there's also a uh, popularity with South Oregon Pinot Noir and vineyards, which which are growing in the region as well. And I and believe me, I'm not opposed to to cannabis or good wine at all. Um, but I do have a problem with unplanned. Uh, agriculture, you know, how do you um, unplanned development, not just agriculture? You know, how do we look at a large area and and accommodate growth and economic develop for development for humans without losing ecological integrity, but also enhancing uh, enhancing forest conditions and and thus I think quality of life. And for me, the the example here leads to the importance of Landscape scale, as well as stand level forest management is not just measuring trees and, and figuring out which ones to cut. It's also being part of the community, right? It's, um, it's the importance of being in uh, local planning commission efforts, local development of economic opportunities so that 
land is used for its highest and best use and there's an integration of existing forest and bird and wildlife conservation, clean water with human needs and economic opportunity. I'll end here without a specific, uh, without specific habitat recommendations for oak habitats, other than to say that uh, a large part of what the Klamath Siskiyou um, Conservation Partnership has done has been uh, clearing and burning of conifers so that oak can restore there. Uh, but there are um, recommendations in several published manuals that can provide guidance in those habitats for bird conservation. Jeff, with that, uh, that ends my webinar, and I think we have some time for questions. So thanks, Bob. That was that was great. And I uh, and if folks have questions that they want to ask Bob, um, that would be great. You can just type them into the to the chat. And while while we're get while while folks are taking the time to do that, Bob, I was going I was going to ask you how this all fit into the Partners in Flight 2016 plan. You know, is what you know you ended on that last piece where you were talking about unplanned. So how how do you plan for this, you know, across these huge landscapes? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, the Partners in Flight, partnersinflight.org, you can find uh, our 2016 land bird conservation plan. In the first part, the first third or more of that plan uh, lays out our watch list species for land birds, grassland birds, as well as forest birds and other scrub shrub birds. Um, we talk a fair amount about how we get to our vulnerability assessment. You can get to that also through the website. But then the second half of that gets to these migratory bird joint ventures, and every joint venture has a two-page, in some cases three-page layout, where the joint venture has a list of species there, of interest is both, uh, there are two metrics there in the vulnerability assessment, which gets lots of attention. One is called a half-life metric, uh, published by Stanton et al. I can put that in the chat later or someone can, the specific uh, citation. But basically it's based on current trends, how many years will it take for that population to be cut in half again? So a half-life metric. And then we combine that with an area importance metric within that geography of a, say, a joint venture. How, what proportion of the breeding population is occurring within that geography? And there are some species where a half-life is, in other words, a population will be cut by 50% within 20 years, and that geography holds over 80% of the breeding population. Well, that helps that partnership determine what our priorities and what uh, what to plan for and what to start building out research and monitoring and del habitat delivery for. And I think in order to stay ahead of the curve on those threats, Jeff is very much a uh, a local regional kinds of issue. Um, and I said personally, I would never have seen a, a clearing of forest patches for cannabis as an issue. But in uh, Northern California, it began to fragment the forest to ways that we don't quite understand yet. So locals stay on top of it. And I know California state, uh, Fish and Wildlife is watching it pretty closely still. All right. So there's a number of questions coming in. Okay. And so Jeff Ritterson from Audubon mentioned, how is climate data used to inform the climate smart conservation decisions? Um, I probably can't a answer that accurately and enough to do it justice. I appreciate the question and I've spent years in climate science, but not this particular climate project. I, I thank people for each of the examples here, but we can get that question to John Alexander and Jamie Stevens and others and be able to get that back out to you. All right, that that sounds good. And so, so this one's related to joint venture practices and recommendations. So the question is from Brian Keevan. He says, are there joint venture practices, recommendations that translate successfully to NRCS incentives and funding, or is the funding conducted by the partnership 
itself, the joint venture itself. So there are indeed uh, the question was to NRCS funding, right? Yeah, right. So across, you know, yeah. again, um, across government platforms and how much, you know, how yeah. well are these partnerships working to take advantage of all the funding that's out there? Yeah. Yeah, I really, I, I asked because I really wanted to highlight that and I appreciate again the, the question, but uh, several joint ventures have hired conservation delivery specialists that work uh, very specifically with uh, NRCS and actually sometimes work for NRCS, but are um, so close in partnership with the joint venture that they take their lead from the joint venture as well as NRCS specifically. Sometimes those positions are funded by multiple partners in the joint venture partnerships and certainly the area in which those uh, biologists work, those field biologists delivering conservation are often directed by um, this kinds of joint, joint venture models that I've just shown you in the three different examples. So there's a close tie there. I know of other partnerships that uh, have similar ties, for example, with um, with Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service and others, so there's a good transfer of money into a into projects that fit the common good of the partnership. No, so that's great, and I see I see that John Alexander uh, posted um, a web link to the Climate Smart Mapping Tool, and he's on here checking to make sure you're you're appropriately representing his work. So and for <laughs> yeah. so, thanks, John. So, yeah. So I also there was also a question earlier, Bob, that, that kind of was, you know, still looking at the desired forest conditions. And it, I think it was from Brad and he mentioned that he thought the, he, he liked the DFC metrics, but he, he wondered whether they were being reviewed at the landscape level to make sure they were actually attainable. You know, how how are they looking at those? to go back and determine for, you know, up front, are they attainable? And then on the back end, ha have you been successful in meeting those targets? Monitoring has been difficult, both in terms of uh, bird response and, and the target metrics that we've put out there. In, in some cases, uh, it, it clearly works and there's clearly a bird response. Uh, in other cases, um, Quite frankly, uh, it hasn't worked so well. So it's it's case by case from those local landscapes. And um, again, if someone from Lower Miss Joint Venture is on, they can write it in the chat. But to my knowledge, there's not been a comprehensive monitoring of how that response is. But in some places, successful. Some places, not so much. Not attainable yet. Okay, and and also, you know, since we're talking about monitoring and such, I will say, and since John John Alexander's on here, I will run another commercial. I think I'm going to get kicked off if I run too many. But uh, in, on on in January on the 18th, we're going to have a webinar on effectiveness monitoring, and it's evaluating the effects of forest management on bird populations, and that is going to be John Alexander from the Klamath Bird Observatory. So again, we're trying to wrap all these things together. We're telling one, trying to tell one story with with these webinars. And so I hope you guys will find that helpful. And, and right now we're kind of, you know, Bob is in this spot where we're moving down from landscape to stand. So we're going to start talking about the stand management. So with that, yeah, I was wondering, Bob, do you want to give a, a little more about the, the video that we're going to let folks see if people have have seven minutes to hang on. Uh, well, I jumped past it. I'll, I'll I'll add a commercial to yours. How's that, Jeff? Uh, it sounds uh, all good. I, I, uh, the, the, as I said from the start, or at least tried to, the um, objective with the examples today was to give a slightly lower than uh, real high elevation look into how different examples have gone from large landscape into stand management. Appalachian Mountains, uh, I only hit the surface, but you mentioned Jeff Larkin earlier, and he will most likely, it's my understanding, he'll go very much more deeply into the Golden Wing Warbler examples and some of that examples in the uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. So that is definitely worth worth attending. Thanks to everyone who listened today. And Bob, thanks for a great presentation. And we look forward to seeing folks in a, in a month. <laughs>
Sounds good. My pleasure, Jeff.